And while our speakers are getting settled, I'd like to introduce this afternoon's moderator, who will then introduce the rest of the program. Lexi Bloom is a senior editor at Alfred A. Knopf, an imprint of the Knopf Doubleday Publishing Group, where she edits a wide variety of award-winning and best-selling literature from around the world. Until 2019, she was a senior editor at Vintage Anchor, Knopf Doubleday's paperback imprints, where she had the pleasure and privilege of working with both Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie and Essie Adujan, our featured writers today. And with that, I'd like to turn the rest of this afternoon over to Lexi. Thanks, Lexi. Thank you so much, James. Um, hello, everyone. It is such a pleasure to be here with all of you this afternoon, or it's afternoon for me here on the East Coast of the US, um, and to have this conversation across time zones, countries, and continents. I am incredibly excited to introduce two of my favorite writers, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie and Essie Adujan. Um, if you could both turn on your cameras now. Um, we are ready for you. Um, we are so thrilled to have you here today to discuss Chimamanda's brilliant and iconic novel, Half of a Yellow Sun, which just this year was the recipient of the Women's Prize for Fiction Winner of Winners Award, meaning it was selected as the best of all the books that have won in the prize's history. Half of a Yellow Sun is a haunting novel of love, war, and moral responsibility set against the backdrop of the Nigerian Civil War. When I sat down to reread it this week, I was bowled over once again by what an amazing book it is from its wide scope down to the tiny precise details paid to each character. A little more about our writers. Um, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie grew up in Nigeria. Her work has been translated into 30 languages and has appeared in various publications, including The New Yorker, The New York Times and Granta among others. She is the author of the novels Purple Hibiscus, which won the Commonwealth Writers Prize and the Hurston Wright Legacy Award, Half of a Yellow Sun, Americana, which won the National Book Critics Circle Award, the story collection, The Thing Around Your Neck, and the essays, We Should All Be Feminists and Dear Ijewele, or A Feminist Manifesto in 15 Suggestions, both national bestsellers. A recipient of the MacArthur Fellowship, she divides her time between the United States and Nigeria. Essie Adujan's most recent novel, Washington Black, was shortlisted for the Man Booker Prize named one of the 10 best books of the year by the New York Times and was an international bestseller. She is also the author of the novels The Second Life of Samuel Tan and Half-Blood Blues, which won the Giller Prize and was a finalist for the Man Booker Prize, the Governor General's Literary Award, the Roger Writers Trust Fiction Prize and the Orange Prize. She's the only, only the third writer to have won the Giller Prize twice. She lives in Victoria, British Columbia. So between the two of you, you've won pretty much all of the literary prizes out there. Um, Shimamanda and Essie, you will talk for about 40 minutes, at which point um, we'll take questions from the audience as James described. Um, so thank you so much again for being with us and I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Lexi. And uh, yeah, hi, Chimamanda. It's Hello. really lovely to finally get a chance to meet you. Uh, you too, virtually, Essie, you I guess. too. <laughs> Yeah, so um, how are you faring during lockdown? I am alive. I think that's <laughs> what matters. No, I'm doing okay. Oh, good, good. And uh, where are you? And currently? how are you? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm in I'm Lagos. Oh, okay. Okay, so quite and a And you're in Toronto? No, I'm in Victoria on Vancouver Island. Ah, yeah, ah. so very west. It's... Um, it's about 10 in the morning here and yeah, lustery morning. So I hope my internet connection holds. <laughs> but um, I'm really delighted to get a chance to talk to you about your gorgeous novel, which I've admired for, for so long. Um, and I understand that your family history was the impetus uh, for the novel. Mm -hmm. But of course, even fiction with per personal touchstones still of course involves a lot of research. So can you talk a little bit about the research process and about how you went about negotiating the personal element with a broader historical record? Like, were there family stories that you mm -hmm. felt absolutely needed to be included? And were there places that you felt that you really, you know, should not go? Things that you really mm. felt that you, you shouldn't say? Mm. Um, and I feel as though having read your work, I'm almost done with Washington Black that these are questions that I could ask you as well <laughs> about <laughs> research and, and balancing these things. I think, the, you know, that question about, is there anything that I, I shouldn't, is there somewhere I shouldn't go? 
was something I didn't allow myself to have because I think in making the choice to write about something that is so contested and still so controversial in Nigeria today, which is the Nigeria Biafra War, I felt that to make the choice to write about it meant that I really had to go there, if that makes sense, and that I, and that I, I had the responsibility not to um, censor, right? And so I remember thinking that if I managed to offend everyone, then I had done something right. <laughs> and so, um, and, and by that I mean, you know, because it's a contested history, people have these positions that are really often set in stone and are unwilling, I think, to acknowledge that even if your cause is just, it's possible that in that just cause, you've also practiced injustices. And, and, and so I, I, you know, so it was important for me, for example, mm. to write about the atrocities that Biafran soldiers committed, even though I think that my novel is really about um, the people wanting to, um, you know, people wanting self uh, autonomy and the people who had a cause that I thought was just, I still think is just, but it was important for me to, you know, tell the truth, I think. And I think fiction has to go there. Fiction has to, fiction has to sort of, um, talk about not only the things that are beautiful, fiction has to talk about the things that are not so beautiful. Yeah, I agree. And you touched upon the fact that it's, uh, you know, a, I guess a contested and contentious history. So I'd be curious to know uh, um, if you could quantify it in, you know, the brief time mm -hmm. that we have, just what the legacy of that war has been in uh, I guess, the Nigerian imagination. Uh, how has it settled? Is it it's still, like, is it something that people um, openly discuss or is it sort of something that people shy away from? You know, how certain histories can be still so painful. Mm. Um, you know, the war is, uh, it's been about 50 years since the war. And so, you know, that's still in some ways very recent. Yes. So I'm curious so. about how that has, um, Kind of settled in the larger psychic uh, imagination of the the country you know it's interesting because i i'm not sure that it has settled i think um it's not just that it's so recent 1970 being quite recent the war ended in 1970 but also that the time that after 1970 it just wasn't talked about it's only recently started being talked about um and i actually like to think that half of the yellow sun was part of that, that the novel gave people a chance to talk about a history that is so contested. When I was in secondary school and primary school, we did not learn anything about that period, nothing. Oh, that's interesting. And so you have Nigerians of my generation who kind of know that something happened between 1967 and 1970, but don't actually know the details of it. And I think only now are we starting to kind of talk about it, but still not very much, still not very much. And I think there's a sense in which even the word Biafra is loaded with, um, it's not a, it's not a value free word. You say it and people already have, depending on what position they're coming from, already have their own misconceptions and their own ideas of where, what, what you mean by saying Biafra. So I find, I find it to be still a difficult thing to talk about, okay. but, but I think it's, I think, I think we're at a place that's better than we were 15 years ago on that subject. And I'm very hopeful about young Nigerians. I think there's, a, maybe it's also the privilege of not having been directly involved in, in what happened. I think the younger generation of Nigerians are more willing to talk about our history. Um, you know, or maybe I'm being overly optimistic, I don't know, but, but I think it's still, a, we still have a long way to go. We don't have, a, we don't have a, a proper acknowledgement of that period. We don't have a memorial to the people who lost their lives. Mm -hmm. We don't have a collective agreement on what happened. No, we don't. Huh. That's, uh, that's fascinating. So there aren't any kind of memorials to, mm -hmm. to this enough, that's... Mm -mm. Huh. Do you feel like that's something that is, um, are people talking about, about that? Is that something that you see, um, I, I guess, Nigerian society eventually working itself towards is, is having a, mm -hmm. a, a more sort of symbolic 
uh, reckoning with what happened? I wish we would. I'm, I'm not sure that that's going to happen anytime soon because I think in general, we're not a country that, but I guess this is, <laughs> I think in general, Nigeria is a country that hasn't fully made peace with its history in general. So mm. with our military history, we just haven't made peace with, with um, so, so I'm not sure that's going to happen anytime soon. The kind of um, collective, um, memorial that I I'm, I find myself a lot more interested in is the collective memorial of storytelling. Mm -hmm. And so what gives me hope is that I know that there are young people today who are asking questions about our past. I've, I've spoken to people who've said, actually because of half of the yellow sun, they go back and they ask their parents, you know, what happened? And then they start reading other things about that period. So for me, it then becomes, if we cannot get to the point where we have this what I would like, of course, which is this sort of collective um, memorial, then, then maybe we can have a memorial that's one of storytelling yeah, by exchanging I stories. Mm. I think that's wonderful. So uh, what are some of the other books that you would send people towards? Oh, about Biafra. Um, yeah. Oh, there are many. There's, well, Chino Achebe wrote a, a memoir Mm -hmm. um, called There Was a Country, which I think is essential reading. He also has a story collection called um, Girls at War, which was quite really important to me when I was writing my novel. Um, Buchie Mecheta has a, a novel called Destination Biafra. And there's a lot of, um, there's quite a bit of, of nonfiction. Um, uh, there's a book called The Nigerian Revolution and the Biafran War, which is written by a, a, a Connell who was in Biafra. And actually, I, it was also really important. I based one of the characters in the book on him. I based Connell Mado on him. Okay. Um, and that's a book that was, I, I really appreciated it because there was a kind of, it was an insider's account, but told with a kind of honesty and without um, sugar coating. Because mm -hmm. I'm always very, <laughs> I'm sort of always sort of very sharp eyed and looking for lies and if I sense that someone is sugarcoating and not telling the full truth I, I just switch off and I just feel like that book didn't do that so that's a book I would recommend that people read Alexander Mati book is the, is the writer's name okay great thank you for that um so the book is I believe it's had its 15th or this would be its 15th year anniversary uh, that so makes me what, feel very old. <laughs> I know, I always have the same feeling when, when people <laughs> say such things to me. But um, so what are your feelings about the novel 15 years on? Um, has your uh, sense of it shifted at all? Um, like, do you go back and read over uh, your, your oeuvre? Or is it something where you kind of can't bear uh, <laughs> to read it? Because you can see all wait, the ways... Wait, which it is it for you, Essie? Which is it for you? Oh. <laughs> But no, I, I never read my, um, once the books are in print, I, I can't, you know, I can't bear to read them. There's always something that you could change. Yes, uh, I, feel, yeah. I feel that way too. But I have to say that um, I recently reread Half of the Yellow Sun, which actually, to be honest, I had never read since it was published. I mean, I'd read bits of it when I do events, and, but actually never read it from start to finish until, until two weeks ago. Okay. And, you know, I, I mean, I, I had this feeling of um, almost watching the person I used to be in a strange sort of way. And there were parts that I just thought, my God, I can't believe somebody published this thing. <laughs> and then there were parts, <laughs> and then there were parts where I thought, hmm, not bad. <laughs> so it, it was kind of, you know, and mixed feelings. And, and I, I I was kind of thinking if I had to, if I wrote that book today, would it be different? Mm. Um, I think it would be, but I'm not sure it would be significantly different. Right. Because, and there were things I discovered. I mean, I'm reading the book, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I've forgotten that happened. <laughs> and then it took me back to the research process. It took me back to how I kept trying to, because I'd done so much research. I had so much material. And I thought everything was absolutely fascinating and needed to go in the novel. Mm. And so in some ways, my editing process was trying to decide or trying to restrain myself really, <laughs> which was sort of me saying, okay, you can't have that in the book, right? It's wonderful that you discovered it, but it doesn't belong in the book. 
And so reading the book took me back to that process and took me back to actually remembering some of the things I had to let go of. Yes. So actually, I'm, I'm so curious about how you put the novel together. So I have a few sort of more specific questions about that. Uh, one of the things that I really admired about it is the way that it drops us into different social perspectives. Uh, so a character like Ubu, for instance, embodies like strong kind of traditional beliefs. Um, you know, he's convinced that Odenigmo's mother is, uh, has put a curse on Olana. Uh, when Olana, you know, goes to kill a gecko climbing a wall, he says, oh, don't, don't kill it. You know, the, you'll have a stomach ache. And, you know, so these sort of, um, sort of more traditional uh, beliefs, whereas a character like Odenigmo, uh, embodies a more, I guess, empirical uh, way of seeing the world. Um, and his relationship with Nigeria is imbued with hopes for its future. So he's very forward looking. Um, and then of course there's Richard Churchill, uh, the Englishman who brings a you know, completely uh, different perspective. So uh, why was it important to you to show things from such different perspectives and points of view? And were there earlier drafts where you were trying to tell the novel through a single point of view? No, I, when I started it, I knew I wanted to do multiple points of view. Um, there, there were earlier drafts where um, the storytelling, especially from Richard's perspective, was just terrible because oh. I, I started off such trouble with Richard in the beginning because I think I was so hung up on Richard being white, a man, English. So the three together just felt to me really alien. And so I was writing Richard in, the, in a kind of pastiche of, um, uh, <laughs> I don't know, um, I don't know, maybe Thomas Hardy. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I don't know. I just <laughs> And at some point, I remember actually the moment when I said to myself, actually, Richard is me. Right? Richard is white, he's a man, he's English, but really he's a person looking for, seeking belonging. And, mm -hmm. and that I could identify with. And that then made it much easier. But Richard, I really struggled with and, and did a lot of rewriting. But I personally believe very much in the idea of multiple stories and how we, we see things, you know, obviously that it depends on one's perspective, that one's view of something depends on one's perspective. And I'm always curious about hearing a story from different sides and from different um, points of view. And with Biafra in particular, you know, Biafra was a terrible, a, the Nigerian Biafra war was a terrible thing that happened. But there were some people who fared better than others. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was important to try and capture that, you know, that it wasn't just about children who are starving and whose, whose bellies were bloated and whose hair had turned red from malnutrition, that there were also in Biafra people whose children still had doll houses. Hmm. Um, and that, and, and I, wanted to, I wanted Richard to bring in the perspective of the outsider, insider, and, and the fact that there were certain privileges that existed for people who, um, so Richard is white and his whiteness brought him a certain privilege. Yeah. which I think that many journalists, foreign journalists in Biafra had. Many of them used that privilege for good in telling the story of Biafra, but I felt that it was important to tell that because it, it was an essential part of, of the story of Biafra. How the story was told was such a part of how that war was seen outside of Nigeria and therefore shaped how people responded to it. And so I just really wanted to try and kind of have a, you know, sort of like a, a full, an attempt at a full, <laughs> a full telling of, um, of what happened. Yeah, and one of the things that I found really fascinating was the way that you saw, I mean, the prejudices uh, of a lot of the European characters and, and of, the, of course the American journalists who we see later mm. in the novel who are kind of disgusted to see children eating rats, even though these, mm. these children are starving, there's nothing else. And they bring, you know, to bear on those kinds of uh, scenes, all of their assumptions about, about uh, Nigerians and Africans in general. Uh, and so, but we also get the, the perspective of the Nigerians who have assumptions about, um, about Europeans and what their preferences are. Um, you know, something 
uh, I guess on the lighter side, just like Harrison, who's constantly cooking beets for Richard <laughs> because he thinks that, you know, all, all English people love beets, uh, which I thought was really charming. Um, you know, that's so actually based. Can I just say that Harrison is actually based on um, the man who works for my family, and so a lot of a lot of Harrison's experiences with the novel, and actually the the man who worked with my family, his name was Harrison. And oh. by the way, I have to say, I, I told when I was working on the novel, he still worked for us, so I, I talked to him about it, and I said, "Is it okay if I use your name?" And he said, "Yes," and he wanted me to use his. <laughs> And he wanted me to use his last name as well. And I thought, no, that's oh, a bit wow. much. So I was like, <laughs> I'll just use your first name. So he told me the story about Beats. And what I was struck by was Harrison was quite an Anglophile. And I was very amused by his, um, you know, the way that he just felt that anything that was English or white was automatically superior. And so he was obsessed with Beats, right? And But what, what I was struck by is how Beats also happened to help him escape because he then used that to pretend to have been hurt and, and he sort of colored his, his clothes with beats and, and said that that was blood. That in fact did happen. That's and I, it just, I was just struck by that, you know, the sort of, I don't know, it just seemed to me a very strange and interesting parallel that on the one hand, your beats are <laughs> um, a testament to your, um, your colonized mind. <laughs> and on the other hand, the, the they thing kind that of save your you. life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh my goodness. So I guess touching on that, I was kind of curious to know uh, which scenes uh, had some basis in fact. Mm -hmm. um, so in particular, the scene in which uh, Olana is taking the train home during all of the chaos to return to her family. And for comfort, she starts kind of stroking the side of a calabash mm -hmm. uh, that a woman has brought with her. And then the woman holding it invites her to look inside uh, and it contains the, the severed head uh, of the woman's daughter, uh, which was for me, one of the most harrowing scenes of the novel. Uh, and in an instant, the thing that gives Olana comfort turns into an object of horror. And I thought that almost sat as a larger metaphor for the horror of war itself, where the things that are familiar to us and that we derive comfort from, are suddenly uh, and forever transformed. Um, but can you talk a little bit about whether, uh, first of all, the construction of that scene, uh, and if that was something that uh, had some basis in fact, uh, like how did you go about writing that scene? So, so yes, actually, it, it did have basis in fact. Um, I found that during my research, I had read, you know, quite a bit um, personal accounts, and this uh, versions of this story kept recurring. You know, the woman who had her child's head, and many of them had her holding the child's head, just sort of cradling the head. Others, she had the child's head in a calabash. Others, she had it in a bag. So it seemed to me that clearly it had happened, but you know, in the way that sometimes a story takes on a kind of mythic significance and, and it starts being told and retold and det details change. I don't know, but the calabash just somehow, I don't know, just, I, don't, I was just so, um, I don't know, haunted by it. Just especially the idea of a beautiful calabash, you know, beautifully carved, something that ordinarily in everyday life one would, you know, put um, nourishing things in. Um, so I really, I mean, just constantly coming across that story, I knew I was going to use it, but I, I wasn't quite sure how. And um, initially, I, I think I remember writing a draft in which Olana um, doesn't quite, where, in which the, a woman is holding her child's head, but Olana just sort of walks past her when she's trying to get on the train. But it didn't, I just didn't think that, I don't know, I wanted something a lot more intimate. Mm. And... Um, but that scene was difficult for me as well because a lot of the scenes, a lot of the things in the book are based on fact. I mean, almost everything really. But obviously, I've you know played with things, but really, almost everything in that book. But some were particularly difficult, and and that one, that scene with the the baby's head was one of them. So was that? And I sorry I've, to interrupt. Was that kind of an oral story that you had been told, or did you see that in? in as part of the written record in a book uh, both both okay. both okay both yes 
if there was one story that often recurred in, in talking to people, in, in reading personal accounts, it, it was that. It was the story of the woman holding her child's head. And I think it almost became, I mean, any account of the massacres of Igbo people in Northern Nigeria invariably um, included a version of that story, the woman holding her child's head. Yeah. Well, that's... Um... And you know, and it's interesting because, um, so in reading Washington Black, which I'm not done with yet, but deeply admire, you know, it's, it's kind of, we all know these terrible things happen. I mean, obviously one is aware of the horrors of slavery, but I'm just reading this thinking, my God, these people were that horrible. You know, I think there's a way in which fiction, <laughs> you know what I mean? There's a way in which fiction, it brings this thing in your face and, and, and almost your first reaction is to deny it and say, surely that didn't happen. And so actually when I was rereading Have of the Yellow Sun and, and got to that scene, even I remember thinking, my God, you know, the, the horror of a woman having to hold, I mean, I, I just, it's unbearable to me. And, and now that I'm a mother, I wasn't when I wrote that. Mm. It is just, just the thought of it is just utterly unbearable. Yeah. Um, but there's a sense in which it's a kind of, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, I guess it's, it's a, her way, this is the one thing she can do, right? It, so you froze it up for me. Start grieving as of. Hello? Sorry, I'm, you're frozen for me a little bit. Oh my goodness. Oh, have I, oh, you've frozen, but I think you're back. Oh, yes. Can you hear me too? Okay. I, Am I still? You're I, still cutting out for me a little bit. <laughs> I see Lexi now. Yeah, let's okay. try it again. Um, hello. Yeah. I can hear oh, you. Lord, not that you can hear me. Okay. Can, can you hear me, Lexi? Yes. All right. Yes. Yes, I, I can. I can hear you now too. It, it would not like be um, a <laughs> pandemic era program without technical difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you can hear me. Okay, I'm good. Yes, I can hear um, you. Okay, so I, I'll I'll shuffle along then. Um, so, what do you see as the role of the written word and and of writing uh, and of art in general in troubled times? Uh, I'm thinking um, in particular of the role that writing plays uh, in this novel, which is, is quite central. Uh, Richard Churchill is a writer, uh, initially writing a book about the, the Igbo uh, Uku bronzes uh, before attempting to write about the war. Um, so, and then of course, I'm reminded of the scene where they return home uh, after the war to find that Odenigbo's library and papers have been burned and books have been burned in Freedom Square. Um, so yeah, what do you see as the role of writing and the written word uh, in troubled times? You've touched upon it a little bit earlier, but um, do you think that artists have a, a special role to play during such times? Um, yes, no pressure, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do. I, I mean, I, as a person who not only, um, so, so sort of, I'm, I'm speaking from the point of view of not just sort of a producer of art or, or writing, but also as a consumer. And I find that, that reading, reading gives me consolation. Um, and in this period that I think is, is a dark period for really for the whole world, reading has given me a lot of consolation. And I don't know what I would, I don't know what I, I don't know what life would be like if I didn't have the, um, the good fortune of reading and of, of hearing stories. And I also think that there is, um, I mean, obviously newspapers are important and one reads them, but there's something that literature brings to us that is essential. And I don't say this just because I happen to practice this thing called literature. Um, I say this as a reader. I really think that reading stories, um, I don't know, it, 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 it's, it, it gives me consolation. It um, gives me perspective as well, I think. Um, 
And I find that while I read history books, and that's fine, when I read historical novels, I don't know, it just makes it, I don't know, it makes it real and true and it brings a complexity and, um, and it makes it difficult to forget. And there are things I think we should never forget. Mm. And I think it's literature that just places things in our, in our memory. So I really do think that, yes, we have a role. Um, you know, I think that we should, you know, I think we should, um, I think we should cure the world of all the ills and, and bring joy and peace to everyone. <laughs> no. <laughs> SC, I think you're responsible for Canada. So. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, have, I'll have that covered and I'll leave the rest of the world to you. <laughs> no, I'll just take Nigeria. I'll take West Africa and you, 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 do, Canada, you do North America. <laughs> oh, 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 okay. Um, so I'm curious uh, as, as a writer, uh, as an artist, uh, do you feel that there are some topics that should be off limits? Uh, for example, Richard stops writing his book uh, because, as he says, the war isn't my story to tell, really. So where, as artists, must we draw the line in our approach to certain material? And is there a line, or should one be able to write about anything? Um, so who do stories belong to, essentially? Ah, oh, that's a very complicated question, I think. And so I think my attempt to answer that would be that, in, in principle, I think people should tell whatever story they want to tell, in principle. I think if we lived in a world that was not um, shaped by history, then that would be true. But we live in a world that's shaped by history and by power. And so mm -hmm. I think, for example, that it was not Richard's story to tell because, um, because it's not, <laughs> you know, but also because there's a long history in which African stories have been told by non-Africans, by Europeans, and those stories have been distorted and, and there have been consequences to those and the way that those stories have been told. And I think that in, if really, if we are really moving towards, if, if that arc of justice really is a true thing that happens, then it's time to try and um, to, so the stories that have taken away the dignity of Africans, it's time to try and get that dignity back. And I think one way to do that is to have more stories about Africa told by Africans. I, and I think this is true for, for many marginalized communities that um, it's important that we hear the stories of these communities from the people in those communities. And so I do think though that it's possible, I mean, Richard, Richard could write that story but he would have to do it with a certain amount of humility. And most of all, with the knowledge that it's not his. Um, and I think that if you come at a story like that, that it's, it, you can tell a good story, but, but it's important to know where you situate yourself. Right. Many of the stories that I, I think were told about Africans by Europeans were told with, a, with an alarming mix of Arab and ignorance. And so, but because they came from a place of power. So you had people across the continent of Africa reading about themselves in stories told by other people in which they were being denigrated and it was supposed to be okay. Mm. Um, actually in Half of Yellowstone, I have this little bit, and this is also based on fact, where a, a journalist writes about um, something written on a, 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 on a truck in Nigeria, which is man must whack. And whack is, you know, whack, like W-H-A-C-K. And this journalist says, oh, it shows you that they're so violent because they're saying that you must whack other people. But actually in Nigerian pidgin, whack is eat. So I think even things of that sort, right? And reading that for me, it's an example of how even without meaning to be malicious or malevolent, you can in fact tell somebody's story in a way that is not true. And um, so in general, I think, you know, I, when I teach writing, I don't, I don't really tell my students, you cannot write that. But I do tell them, you have to be very intentional when you're approaching a, a story and a subject that doesn't really naturally belong to you, especially when you're coming from a group that is more powerful. I think that's important because if we, if we have a clear eye view of, of history in the world, we can't just pretend that these things don't matter because they do. I agree. Um, 
So I guess in summary, it would be that you don't feel that uh, things should be entirely off limits to certain groups. It's all about the angle of approach. Uh, if you're writing as an outsider, you must take that outsider's stance uh, and not, uh, yes. yeah, not write from the inside. I, yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that as well. Um, so you uh, spoke just a few minutes ago about how reading has become a great consolation to you. Mm. Uh, during these uh, very uh, tumultuous and, and painful and, and strange yeah. times. Uh, can you tell us uh, what you're reading these days? I'm reading Washington Black, which is a novel I think everyone should read. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it right there. <laughs> I'm also reading um, I'm reading, so generally what I do, which is probably not a good thing, but I read a number of things at the same time. I which do is testament thing. to my, do you? Well, that makes me I feel do. better, I'd say. You know, testament to our collective um, short attention spans, I guess. So I'm, I'm reading your novel, which I'm almost done with. I'm also reading um, um, Wallace Tegna's novel, which I'd never read before. Um, uh, what is it called? Passing Through. See, now I have to look it up, but it's a, it's a really lovely novel about two, two couples in, I don't know, maybe up somewhere in rural Vermont or somewhere. And it's, it's very slow and very um, consoling. <laughs> so I kind of almost read it like I read poetry. Um, I'm also reading a book about, um, um, it's by Zach Carter, and it's, uh, it's a kind of biography of Mina Keynes. And why am I reading it? Because I guess I just decided I wanted to read more sort of, I don't know, about dead economists. Um, lens every day. <laughs> and I'm also reading a lot of trying to write fiction. And I'm trying to write fiction and read poetry. I'm also reading. Oh, reading a really lo lovely novel called The Murmuring Coast, which is Portuguese, translated from the Portuguese, um, and set in an African country colonized by the I think we're having some technical difficulties again. Um, Mr. Amanda is temporarily frozen. Um, so while she is... Well, we again. Can, oh. Let's see if we've got you back. Um, you you're frozen. Um, Lexi, who's frozen? Am I or is that Now you are back, Chimamanda. Yes. Am okay. I? Okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, is Essie back? Essie is back. Yeah. Can you see um, me? This seems like a great moment <laughs> for me to, uh, to open it up to questions. We have so many questions coming in from everybody. Um, so why don't I get those started? Um, we have a lot of specific questions about Half of a Yellow Sun. Um, this first one is from someone named Karen. Um, what impressed me most about Half of a Yellow Sun is the proximity and universal universality of war, how anyone living a perfectly comfortable life may end up dragged by its tragedies. My question is, what does Chimamanda think is the best way to preserve peace without being submissive? Ooh, I wish I knew. I would bottle it and sell it. <laughs> and then finally buy that damn house I want to buy. Um, I don't know, I, I, <laughs> I don't know. In general, I'm, you know, so that, that idea of pacifism isn't, I, I don't believe, I believe that sometimes war is necessary, but I sometimes feel that the leadership we have across the world um, doesn't always do the most they can before they choose violence. Um, and increasingly, I'm starting to wonder whether it has something to do with gender, but I don't want to give a feminist rant, so I'll stop there. <laughs> I wonder if there were more women leaders, whether we would have as many wars as we've, as we've had. I don't know, maybe, maybe not, but I do wonder. It's a very good question. <laughs> um, from Violetta, we have a question. Apart from the personal trauma that the Biafran War caused to Nigerian families, would you consider it a cultural trauma? Was the cultural mm -hmm. identity of Nigerians affected by this event? The cultural identity? I, I don't think so. I mean, I think, I think obviously it was based on identity. It was based on ethnic identity. Um, 
So people were being killed because they were from a particular ethnic group and that sort of thing. But I, I don't know that it necessarily changed after, after the war. I think, um, and I also have to say that I think ethnic identity is not a bad thing in itself. It becomes a bad thing when people politicize it. You know, ethnic identity can be quite beautiful because it's about cultural traditions, about language, about song, about music. Um, but when it's politicized, then it becomes a problem. Um, Carla would like to know if your writing Chimamanda is influenced or inspired by any specific authors or literary movements. And if so, um, are they from all over the world? Are they Nigerian, African, or also English and American? Oh, um, I, I, there's so many writers I love from, from all over the world. Um, I love good writing, I love a good story. And really that's been my thing. I, I read everything, I just want to love it. Um, I don't know, it's difficult for me to talk about who, who I'm inspired by because then it makes me feel like, who are you copying and who, you know, and then I'm thinking, my God, I was hoping I was kind of original, thank you very much. So, but I think, I mean, I think I do think that I have to have been um, somehow shaped by the books I loved when I was young. And so I think there's a tradition of African writers who, you know, Chinua Achebe and, and Flora Mwapa, um, who I think shaped my, my sense of confidence as a writer, I think, more than anything else. And then, um, and then the books that I've loved since, and they're just quite a range. I, there's a lot of American writers I love, English, English writers, European writers, Indian writers. Um, so really, really, really a range. And other African countries, the um, South African writers and Kenyan writers who've been important to me, and Grace Ogos I loved from Kenya. Um, so yeah, it's difficult to, there is a writer who lately I, I, just, I just adore, and I read her, I dip in and out now that I'm trying to write, and her name is Elizabeth Hardwick, and I think she is sublime. I would agree. <laughs> um, okay, let's see. This is a question for both Essie and Chimamanda. Um, would you say there's a common theme or a question that you keep tackling or unpacking in each of your novels? Um, or do you want to do something different with each book? That's like the mm. question of the, the hedgehog and the fox in <laughs> Neverland. Uh, are you a hedgehog? <laughs> Was it the hedgehog knows one big thing, but the fox knows many things? Um, you know, I, I like to think that I'm a fox uh, because every book uh, is dealing with, um, you know, a different time period, uh, vastly different characters. Uh, but, uh, it, you know, it keeps being driven home to me that, no, I, I really have an obsession with, um, with identity, uh, with belonging. Uh, you know, there, there's stories about uh, people who are very extraordinary, um, living in times in which that, uh, you know, their gifts are, are failing to be recognized. So these seem to be uh, through threads uh, throughout all of my books, but, but uh, you know, I still continue to say that, that I'm a fox, that I, that I you know, I'm, I'm committed to, to doing different things with every book. How about you, Chimamanda? I think I'm a fox too, but you know, who knows? And yeah. one of the things I try, and I, in general, I, I try not, I don't want to be my own um, psychotherapist. And I don't want to be my book psychotherapist. And so sometimes people will point out similarities between my work and it's a surprise to me. It's like a revelation to me. And I'm not sure I want to know, right? Because I think for me, each book is also a kind of discovery, a kind of journey, a kind of um, seeking. But I like to think that because I'm at different places in my life when I've written my different books, that, that they are different. But I don't know, who knows? I, but yeah, I, I will insist on my fox status. <laughs> um, here is a question from Arabella for Chimamanda. Um, what are the key aspects and attributes of Richard that white people should consider in terms of tackling the disease of racism and striving for a world of peace and harmony? There's an innocent curiosity in his character that this that Arabella relates to that seems different from Susan, who seems entirely ignorant and self-centered. Do you think these two characters represent two types of white people or is it more complex than that? Yeah, it's more complex, but I, I do have to say that um, I'm not sure that Susan is necessarily coming from a place of ignorance. And I sometimes feel that in, in having a conversation about racism, it's too easy to say, oh, it's ignorance. Susan has lived in Nigeria for a while. She's educated. She's um, so she's not ignorant, right? She's making a choice. 
she's making a choice to see the people as inferior. So, um, so no, so I don't think Susan is ignorant. <laughs> Richard, I guess there is an innocence to him, but there's also humanity to him, you know, and, and I know people like this who, who just see people as human. Um, I don't know, I mean, this sort of larger question about what should, I don't know, I mean, what should white people do? I, you know, white people should just stop being racist, maybe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think, I think Richard, there's a humanity to him. There's also a willingness to see people and kind of um, push aside whatever cultural education he's had about what black people are. And he's had quite a bit because he comes from um, sort of upper class Englishness, which in itself has a tradition of anti-black racism. But Richard chooses to brush that aside and see people as human. And I think Richard proves what is possible, which is it is in fact possible to see people as human and know that, um, that superiority or inferiority has absolutely nothing to do with skin color or where one comes from. Mm -hmm. Um, sort of connected, um, someone asks, with the whole focus on Richard being unfit to author the story of Biafra, could you elaborate on your choice to have Ugu author, The World Was Silent When We Died? I think it was, I mean, first of all, I just love Ugu. Um, I think Ugu is kind of a version of me, but just not with my, I mean, Ugu obviously is a, you know, grows up in a, in a village, he's not educated, all of the things that I'm not, but, um, he, he's, he, he's curious about the world. He loves storytelling. He wants to learn. And I think I wanted also to write about, um, because I think in this country, in Nigeria, we often think of domestic help as people who are somehow not quite fully human and who don't have their own dreams and their own abilities. And I wanted to challenge that. So Ubu doesn't have the opportunity because he's born in this poor village. But then when he gets an opportunity, look how bright, look how, you know, look how, look, look at what he does. Um, so I wanted, I think, to also, it wasn't just a question of race. I mean, you know, it's not Richard's story, it's Ubu's story, but I think it was also a question of class. Um, it's not necessarily about the person who's born into privilege. It's also about a person who um, has talent and is hardworking. And, and we watch the, you know, you see the trajectory of Ubu from, the boy who's who's never seen a refrigerator and who stops chicken in his pocket, oh. which was a, a scene that I, I I laughed stupidly while I wrote that, I like and then that we scene. sort of <laughs> we sort of see him become this full person, flawed yes, but a full person, and and I think I just wanted to I just felt that it couldn't be anybody's story but his. Um. Several people have asked um, what experiences in your own life, Chimamanda, might have similarities or overlap with some of the characters. So you just talked about, you know, Ugu, are there other characters that you've written um, where you feel, you know, maybe there's a piece of you in their stories? Huh. See, this is, I, I think there's a piece of me in everybody I write, really. I mean, to be honest, I think, you know, I think Madame Bovary, c'est moi, c'est moi, c'est moi. Um, I think I think Kainene, I think I gave Kainene my sense of sarcasm, but I think I multiplied it for her. So she's much more interesting than I am. Um, I think Olana has my um, uh, I don't know, wanting to be a dutiful daughter, but unlike me, Olana doesn't strain against that desire. She embraces it. I don't. I have that desire and I practice it, but I'm always sort of, there's always a tension there for me. Um, I think even Odenibo, there's a bit of me in Odenibo because I'm known after I've had a few glasses of wine to just go on and on about how to fix the world. Um, and many of these things are often not practical, but you do. Um, so I, I, I think, and Richard, I mean, I think, I think there is me in Richard, the sense of there's a kind of, um, there's a, there's almost a melancholy romanticism in Richard. There's a, a, a longing, and I, I have that in my life, a longing for, Sometimes for things I can't even name, I've just always had that. And I think when I made, when I realized that Richard was me, I think I wrote that part of me into Richard. Um, so I kind of feel like most of my major characters, there's always a bit of me in them, but I, I don't think, I've never written a character that's me. I don't think I could actually, um, but, but yeah. Um, 
We unfortunately only have five minutes left. So I am going to make this the last question. Um, it is for Chimamanda, but I'm gonna turn it to both of you. Um, and it is from someone who is very inspired by you, which is a teenager. How did you become a writer? And what is your advice um, for aspiring writers? Oh, my advice is right, 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 right. Um, don't let anybody tell you that you can't be a writer. Um, read everything you can, read everything. Read newspapers, read books, read poetry, read everything. Um, sometimes the things you don't like, just read them so you can figure out why you don't like them. And write, and um, don't show it to your parents, not yet at least. Um, if you have a friend <laughs> that you trust, show it to your friend. If you don't have a friend, don't show it to anybody. Just keep writing until you have a pile and then you'll find somebody to show it to. But just keep writing. I really think it's important um, for anybody who wants to be a writer to do both, which is to read and to write. You, you cannot be a good writer if you're not a good reader. And good luck. I know what it's like to be a teenager wanting to write. <laughs> <laughs> and Essie, do you have anything you might add to that really excellent advice? Yes, that's great advice. I, I think maybe the only thing I would add is that uh, you should try and keep regular hours with your writing, uh, whether that's, you know, two hours on a Friday night that you get to, you know, sneak away uh, from your from your friends, from your job, uh, just stick to those hours because if you kind of wait around for, uh, you know, for the muse to strike or to, to um, you know, to arise, uh, you're not going to write anything. Uh, you yeah. have to be pretty disciplined about it. And I agree with Chimamanda that don't don't tell anybody uh, <laughs> what you're writing, uh, you know, until you've got a <laughs> fairly good hold on it. Just keep it. Oh my keep goodness. it you know, I, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more with SC and it's, it's advice that I have to take actually, that bit about being disciplined. It's, it's I, <laughs> I think it's utterly essential and it gets even more important after you've been published. <laughs> as yeah. I'm learning. <laughs> yeah, I know. It, it can feel, uh, especially when you have children, it can feel impossible sometimes to, to <laughs> find that time. Uh, so yeah, I found that I just had to sort of say, okay, these are my hours. You know, mm. please don't, um, mm. don't bother me. And do you find, and do you find, do you actually stick, you stick to it? You're, you're, you're very good about yeah, Mostly. yeah, and I, yeah, I've, it's been made easier by the fact that my children are both in school now, uh, and the schools are open here. So, you know, I, I do have that kind of uh, four hours yeah. during the day to to focus mm -hmm. on things. But it's also hard because you've got emails to write, and you've got yes. you know you've got events, and you've got all of this. Yes. So yeah. yes, <laughs> but you do the well. Best. Thank you, Izzy, for taking out time from your four hours today. Yeah. Yeah, what's today? It's a Saturday. <laughs> but hey. Yes. <laughs> okay. That's so lovely to meet you. Um, and you too. And I hope we get to meet properly when um, when the world is right again. Yes. Yeah. I hope so. Let me say thank you very much to both of you um, for taking the time to do this, um, for your great conversation, um, and for this opportunity also to celebrate Half of a Yellow Sun. Um, and thank you to our bookselling partner, um, Changing Hands Bookstore in Tempe, Arizona, and a reminder um, to all of you out there to please order a copy from them if you don't have one already, and to please support your independent booksellers. Um, and uh, on behalf of everyone at the Canop Doubleday Publishing Group, um, thank you to all of us out there for joining us for the How Have I Not Read This Book Club. Thank you, Lexi. You were fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for signing in. I'll just chime in at the very end here to thank all three of you. And also, I, I do like to end these by giving um, those who turned up a sneak peek at what the next selection will be. So just as we did the last time and announced Half of Yellow Sun, uh, our next selection in How Have I Not Read This will be Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway. Uh, that program, I'm very excited to say, will feature Michael Cunningham, who has just contributed a new introduction to the Vintage Classics Edition. And he will be in conversation with Sarah McNally, it will be moderated by vintage editor, Diana Secker-Tesdell. And our book selling partner with Sarah McNally involved will of course be McNally Jackson. And you can purchase your copy of the vintage classics edition of Mrs. Dalloway there. For now, thank you all very much. Um, a peaceful weekend to everyone. Chimamanda, Essie, Lexi, um, my gratitude. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.